because you only get one shot. That's it. One shot. And from the very moment you're conceived, there's a date, a day and a time out in the future, you're going to die from the moment you're conceived. And what you do between that moment and the other moment is up to you. And if you wait to be happy, you're going to run out of time. Alrighty, folks, welcome back to Transacting Value, where we're encouraging dialogue from different perspectives to unite over shared values. Our theme for what is now season four is intrinsic values. So what your character is doing when you look yourself in the mirror. Now, if you're new to the podcast, welcome. And if you're a continuing listener, welcome back. Today, we're talking our January core values of determination, accountability, and self-respect with one of my personal mentors, master instructor and owner of the Family Martial Arts Center in Mount Dora, Florida, Master Gary Wayne. So without further ado, folks, I'm Porter. I'm your host, and this is Transacting Value. All right, Master Wayne, how you doing? Doing well, Josh. Looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, first off, let me just say uh, thank you for making some time out of your day. I know you've got a busy life and a lot of things going on. So for the sake of relatability and a little bit for the sake of time, Let's just start out with who you are, where you're from, and what things have shaped your perspective on life. Originally from Louisville, Kentucky, now live in Mount Dora, Florida. Moved here in 1994. Been practicing Taekwondo and martial arts practically my whole life. Got black belt when I was 1974. Second on 1981. Sixth on master instructor in 1996. Seventh on black belt a couple of years ago. I can't remember exactly when. And have owned and operated the Family Martial Arts Center since August of 2001. So I've had a commercial school roughly 23 years. So I've been doing this a long time. That is a long time. I didn't realize it was that long. Congratulations. <laughs> in which you were one of the participants and got black belt with me. So that's hence the discussion we're having, I guess. Yeah, well, in large part, right? Like you started... I suppose unwittingly at the time, a perspective shift for me. And a lot of that started around, I'm not sure if it's your brand or or otherwise, but what we were studying and training, you called them the five tenets of Taekwondo, right? right? So courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control and indomitable spirit for anybody listening. Right. And so I'm curious, where did you come up with those or, or how did you decide on those? Well, those tenants, the founder of Taekwondo, without giving a dissertation on history and development of Taekwondo, was founded by a Korean master. His name was General Che. He was actually a general of the Korean army during World War II. And he was responsible for the development of martial arts in Korea, which was called Taekyung at the time. And then in 1955, after World War II and going through some personal issues, he moved to the United States and try to teach Take Young to Americans. But Take Young was Korean. It was hard for Americans to understand. So he changed it in a way he thought Americans could relate to and called it Taekwondo, which means kick, punch, way, and integrated the five tenets. So to my knowledge, the five tenets were developed by Master Che or General Che in conjunction with the teaching of the martial arts Taekwondo. So it's his invention. And uh, the world is the lucky recipient of that because Taekwondo is practiced by over 50 million people worldwide as an Olympic sport. So it's come a long way since 1955. But I'm sure General Che realized that if you don't develop a character along with physical skills, then the outcome is going to be vastly different because the character skills are much more important than physical skills anyway, which you discover later on in life. But for the most part, all of those tenets are integrated in all take one no training. Well, so, okay, if we're talking character over competence, you can train towards a skill set and get better at it, obviously, and improve. But when you're talking about developing your character, obviously, that's more of a lifelong thing. And for me, I think it's fair to say I was largely unwitting as that developed for probably the first 30 years of my life until I sort of took more of a conscious effort and an active role in my own growth in humanities, I suppose. Did you find for you that this growth and this process is still continuing even after all you've accomplished? Or are you sort of set in your perspective now? Oh, no, no, no. It's all these things are ideals and our ideals are just like onions. 
You know, no matter how many layers you peel off, there's always another layer. So the key ingredient to understanding what all those values are is understanding that you don't know one-tenth of one percent of really their true meaning. Because depending on where you were born and where you live in the world and your life experiences, you're going to have a different perspective on all of those things. But they're always in constant flux, always. But the basic principles, I'm sure everybody would agree on, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, be kind to each other, you know, general principles that I think the world universally accepts. It's how we get there is the road. And Taekwondo is just one path to get there. So I would say, if I'm answering your question, that with age comes wisdom. And the older you get, the more apparent a lot of these things come to you. But usually that only happens with time and experience. And if you're lucky enough to get that time and experience, that's why you see a lot of of senior citizens or elderly people really come to terms with life and its meaning and are basically just happy. Now, I know there's exceptions to that, but I find the older I get, my physical skills go down, but my happy quotient goes up. And that's a direct result of focusing on those principles that we just talked about. Yeah. Well, for me too, I suppose in sort of a different scale, but so while we're talking about some of these things that, you know, more indirectly represent Taekwondo and people's interpretation of it as not just a physical skill set, let's talk about you and some of your personal values. And so this is a segment of the show called developing Developing character, character. developing Developing character. character. It's three questions as vulnerable or as open as you want to be. And for the record, and anybody listening, if your answer happens to be, I'm not sure, or I haven't really thought about it, that's cool too. So let's start with this first question. And this is again for your personal values and some relatability to set the tone for the conversation. So the first question, Okay. when you were growing up as a teenager, what were some of your personal values? (laughs) Have a car, (laughs) have money, have a girl that liked me, get good grades in school and have fun with my friends. Sounds like you're in good company. Yeah. (laughs) I I think that's pretty much it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's about where my head was as well. So let's roll to question two then. And you've touched on this a little bit, but for the sake of the flow, the second question is present tense. What are some of your personal values now? Well, personal values, I guess, are interpreted by me because I can only speak for me. I can't speak for anybody else. Mm -hmm. But personal values are really what you write in your book of truths. And everybody's got one of those. So you'll take your book of truth out and you'll write something in it that you believe to be true based on your life experience. And that can be about anything, anyone, or anybody. So let's just say for the sake, let's take some obvious ones. Let's just take money. So I think everybody would put money as something that they value in their life. And then they they write a truth about money in their book. But money is a tool, but some people make it a destination. Like, I have to have a lot of money. So what's a lot of money? Thousand dollars, a hundred thousand, a million, ten million, a billion. You know, what is a lot of money to you? And if you make money your destination, eh, then you'll never be happy because somebody will always have more money than you. So your value in money also is a sacrifice, a personal sacrifice you have to make. Like if you work, you know, it's time away from your family, it's time away from people that you love, it can create health problems. So do you have balance, you know, balance with work and uh, family life, home? And these are things you juggle your whole life. And sometimes it takes a very long road down a very wrong path for you to realize that you were looking at the wrong thing at the wrong time. Instead of having enough money to be satisfied, you looked at money as the end game and everything else had to suffer. So that's just one example. Another value that you could have could be with time. So time should be valuable because you only got X amount of time and once you spend it, it's gone forever. But suppose you you spend your time away from people you love, away from family, that you value your personal time and you want to go hike the mountains and you want to go visit India and you want to sail around the world and all these things are wonderful things. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but not making your family a priority of your time, your mom, your dad, your sibling, that could turn out to be counterproductive because the importance of those people 
the value of those people are also in your book of truth. And you establish a number of them on how much energy that you're going to give to them. So it sounds like it's complicated, but in reality, it's not complicated. It's just misdirection that gets you in trouble. And the older you get, the better you learn to balance all of those things. So I would say, yeah, I would say that if you regularly visit your book of truths and are not afraid to change some of the things you thought were true into they're not and not be willing to accept the fact that you're making bad decisions like over smoking, over drinking, not exercising, you get the idea Mm -hmm. and not willing to change those things. Then you're headed in a very dark direction. That's one thing I like about martial arts is it's, it seems to act as a buffer to a lot of those things because you immediately see the impact of those things in martial arts because anything that's counterproductive to your, your mental health, your physical health or your spiritual health is always bad, (laughs) no matter what it is. So you have to learn to recognize, focus on that and be willing to change it. So maybe that was a convoluted answer, but that's basically the way I look at it. I'm always going through my book of truths and changing it all the time. Even now, as soon as I get off the phone, I'll go, ooh, dang, I said that, I, you know, and I forgot about that. I need to change that, that kind of thing. Well, it's like you said, it, it has to be sort of an open-minded development and willingness to grow. I think a lot of that's generational, though, or maybe that's not the right sure word. Sure it is. You know, based some on of, the phases yeah, of your life. Of it, a lot of it is taught, but eventually you come to a point where you have to make your own decision. Mm-hmm. And people don't realize, or most, at least myself included, most people don't realize that The world was not created to make me happy. I was created to make me happy. And the only person that has power over that is me. So if I'm unhappy, the only way out of it are personal decisions that I make. And it really aren't dependent on anybody else. I mean, your parents guide you, but they're people too. They make mistakes. And then when you get to be a grown human being, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, you become an adult, a lot of people play Blame games. It's their fault. It's my dad's fault. My uncle's fault. My sister's fault. My boss's fault. I'm not happy. I don't have because. When the truth is, it was the quality of your decisions that put you where you are, not other people. You know, people always disappoint. Always. There's no such thing as a perfect person. So if you put your value on what other people say and do about you and for you, then you can never be happy. Never. So the truth is, For all people, you and only you are responsible for your happiness. And then you got to figure out what that means to you. And that's it. That's hard to do. Some people live their whole life and never figure it out. Well, there's a fair amount. If you know what it is, yeah, if you know what it is that makes you happy, well, then you should do it. Now, I'm not talking about things that are dangerous or evil to other people. I don't mean anything like that. Mm -hmm. I mean within the context of personal development and respectful to other people but i guess that goes without saying i guess oh well maybe not i mean if you never hear it and you never see it then maybe it never occurs in your uh habits of thought you know so it doesn't really translate into action at that point but the trigger i guess for this metric of a quality of happiness or a quality of your decisions right this internal locus of control you start taking ownership maybe holding yourself accountable or be willing to take criticism from other people who are holding you accountable for your decisions i think that point in your life when you start taking that active role is at least in my opinion more the mark of adulthood than now you can legally drink or rent a car without a fee right so (laughs) you know when you're talking about i guess philosophy to a degree but the practical application of that in how you treat people and how you interpret the world whatever that means in your setting and situation for anybody listening i think that that active role carries a lot more weight. Alrighty, folks, sit tight. We'll be right back on Transacting Value. Conflict is necessary, normal, and everywhere. Imagine if it didn't exist. No growth, no creativity, no resilience. From differences of opinions with friends or family to how we talk to ourselves to more physically violent situations, conflict is suffocatingly always present. So where can we start sifting through the lifelong journey of learning to handle it? At the Family Martial Arts Center of Mount Dora, Florida, learning the art of skillfully ending conflict entails more than just learning to kick and punch. 
Through confidence building martial arts programs, our team at Family Martial Arts Center will help men, women, and children become the best they can be. Humility may be a mindset and courtesy may be an option, but spiritual fitness and learning to surround yourself with wise counsel are life lessons for successful defenses against conflict. Lead your life by embodying an example that the future you can look back on and be proud. Check out mtdorakarate.com and look in the show notes for more information. You know, when you're talking about, I guess, philosophy to a degree, but the practical application of that in how you treat people and how you interpret the world, whatever that means in your setting and situation for anybody listening, I think that that active role carries a lot more weight. And so I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. I still got to hit you with question three and developing character, but I'm curious real quick while we take this tangent, how do you explain that? I mean, you've got students that are six years old and younger and 16 years old and older, and then grown adults and of all backgrounds and lifestyles. So how do you encourage or how do you think it's best to encourage this sort of realization and growth and taking the reins on your perspective? You know what I mean? Like developing this internal locus of control. How do you do that? Well, I mean, that's a, that covers a wide area, but what I would say as an instructor, you lead by example mm. and how you treat your students should reflect what you expect from them as students. You know, what, the number one thing out of the gate is always respect. Always. You don't have respect. There is no learning environment. Zero. It's impossible to teach without respect. Impossible. You know, there's a saying, you can't make a duck climb a tree no matter how hard you try. That's a saying. So if I don't have a student in the school that's not willing to come out of the gate with a degree of respect that is necessary in class, they simply cannot be a student. Mm. And everybody knows the bowing and the yes, sir, and the no, sir, and the Mr. Miyagi approach. And, but that's, that's not really what I mean. What I mean is they have to believe that I have their best interest in mind. And then my mission is to get them to black belt. So I'm here to take them there and do whatever I can to help them achieve their goal. And when they feel that, they will feel it emotionally because they can sense it by my actions and my words. They'll feel it physically by the exercises that I give them and the demand I make of them physically to get better. And they'll recognize it spiritually because there's a nirvana that happens to people when they're in a group of people of common thought, all working toward the same goal, and everybody supports everybody because it takes a village to raise a black belt. Mm. So you get a great sense of community. So it's kind of a microcosm of all of those tenets, you know, courtesy. You, there has to be a lot of, everybody has to respect and be nice to each other to make that happen. Integrity which means I got to tell people the truth sometimes, things they don't necessarily want to hear, but it'll benefit them. But also, you know, positive reinforcement. Perseverance. You can't quit when it gets hard. I mean, that's a life lesson. Mm -hmm. Self-control, since we deal with this, there's going to be emotion, anger, resentment, disappointment. And all those things have to be learned how to be tempered in order to proceed forward. And indomitable spirit, which means uh, a lot of enthusiasm is put into what you do. All of that is in every class. And if you repeat that over and over and over, and you do it long enough, then you see dramatic changes in all those areas. Physical development, obviously. Mental development, obviously. And spiritual development, obviously. But that's a never-ending role. That's what I like about it. Because mm -hmm. no matter how much of that you do, there's always another onion peel under it. Mm -hmm. Always. Now, that goes for a six-year-old, and a 25-year-old and a 60-year-old in my class. It's all the same. Everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to be healthy. Everybody wants to have peace of mind. Everybody wants to be reasonably prosperous. Everybody wants to have friends. And everybody wants to do something that they enjoy doing and love. Everybody wants that around the world. And age, sex, weight, height, religion doesn't make any difference. It's all the same, at least from my perspective. Sure. So that's how I do it. Well, I appreciate that. And for anybody listening, and uh, I guess Master Wayne, to take it back a, oh man, I don't know, a couple decades now, there was a, a story that you told us, which 
to any grain of truth, obviously I can't confirm or deny I wasn't alive, but the way the belt system is structured, right? For anybody listening, and this isn't specific to Taekwondo, this is a generic reference, but you start out as a white belt, you know, it's clean. There's not really any sweat or dirt or time equity put into any sort of growth at that point. It's brand new and you're just open to taking all the stains and all the dirt and everything that comes with the perseverance that you just alluded to. Now, currently, that may mean as you test and belt up, you get a new belt that's the fabric's already dyed and whatever color perspective to a style. And then eventually you work your way up until it's a combination of all the above and it becomes black. But initially, based on all the hard work and the effort that you put in and the resilience that you've built, the belt becomes darker and darker and darker, right? Maybe it's sweat, maybe it's dirt, maybe it's effort and energy and all the above that accumulate on the belt because you're not going to wash the effort that you put into it away. And so eventually over decades, it becomes black. And I think that metaphor still applies, but it's represented by these physical belts now when you're talking about martial right, arts and it's spiritual growth for somebody. That's correct. Master Wayne, what are some, I guess, influences that have helped you develop and grow? Because you repeat a lot of the same things now that I was taught decades ago, just because it's the foundation and it's always new students coming in and it requires repetition and exposure. But I'm sure over the last 40 some years almost that you've grown. What have you used? What influences have you come across to help shape your perspective? Well, you have to surround yourself with people that are better at what you do than you do. All right, folks, sit tight and we'll be right back on Transacting Value. Did you know that children who do chores to earn their allowance have more respect for finance and more of a drive for financial independence? Did you know that families who complete tasks together have stronger bonds? Did you know that cognition, sense of self, and anxiety all improve if people have regular interactions with nature? Imagine what instilling self-esteem, resilience, family, teamwork, and an authorized sense of self could do for the growth of each generation, no matter the temptation. At Hoof and Clucker Farm, that's just another Tuesday. Want to learn how to homestead or just more effectively develop your character for an unknown future? Follow or direct message on Instagram at Hoof and Clucker Farm. Watch it happen in real time. A wise man learns from the mistakes of others. A foolish man learns from his own. Well, you have to surround yourself with people that are better at what you do than you do. And I've got a, a huge basket of other school owners and other instructors that are much better at this than I am. And we communicate with other on a regular basis on ideas and concepts and but it's not just them i also surround myself with people that are better at life than i am what does and that mean i have a group of people that i meet with once or twice a week that are great life coaches because they're great people and they teach me a lot about life so i seek out my company by the quality of their friendship to me because long since are gone the days of fly by night friends and people that aren't really interested in personal growth and people that aren't interested in philosophical things. And I could go on and on and on long since those people have gone. And I've learned that if I surround myself with positive minded people that are interested in their personal growth, either physically, mentally, or spiritually, or best all three, then I grow exponentially. Hmm. My growth stops when I stop doing that because I look at my life like this. I look at my life like I'm on an escalator. I'm always either going up or I'm going down, but I'm never staying in the same spot. So if I'm not working on my mental development, my spiritual development, and my physical development, I'm going backwards. If I'm doing those things, I go forward. And I try to do something with regards to all three every day. It's reading, reading good books. I watch a lot of TED Talks on YouTube. I could go on and on and on. I'm looking for spiritual leaders and educational leaders and emotional leaders. And I seek them out to teach me new ideas and concepts. 
And it's been said since the dawn of time, the quality of your friends determine the quality of your life. Mm. That's it. That's it. If you want to find out who you're going to be in the future, look around and look at your friend because that's you. So you want to know something pretty wild about that point, though? I was talking to my son. For anybody listening, he's eight years old now. And we play a game, or a game platform, I guess, called Roblox most nights each week because we're long distance. And so, Master Wayne, playing that game, if you're unfamiliar, there's a bunch of little games within it that you can pick and choose. And, you know, you want to play one over another that night. You can bounce back and forth, whatever, on the platform. But the point is, anybody can send you a friend request. And now I think it's capped at 200 friends, right? So you can message each other, you can whatever, as you go into these different games. But so you've got 200 friends. And so last night, he and I are playing on Roblox. And he tells me that somebody sent him a friend request, but he couldn't accept it, right? So as humans in, in the real world, if you can't accept somebody's request for friendship, it's probably because it doesn't align with you. You don't know them. You don't like them. You got in a fight, whatever. But in Roblox, and I'm arguing here, any digital platform, if you can't take on a friend request, it's probably something more superficial. So when I asked him last night, why can't you accept that friend request? He said, because I have too many friends. I said, what do you mean you have too many friends? He said, well, I have 200 friends. And so I can't make any more friends. I said, okay, well, what do you know about those people and why are they your friends? He said, well, they sent me requests. That's all I know. So I think there's an important distinction here just for the sake of a generational shift from what you're saying, Master Wayne, to what he's telling me last night, that the quality of your friends, if you think about a digital environment, which is more hybrid now than I think it's ever been for the human race, but if you think of a digital environment, where anybody, like on a gaming platform, can be your friend nominally, because that's what it's called in the game. You request friends or whatever. A human built that, designed it, programmed it to mimic real life. But what's not mimicked in a digital environment is the quality of character behind those relationships or behind those individuals and screen names and usernames. Or within the relationships that you build, more often than not, they stay pretty superficial. And I think it's an important distinction to make that, Master Wayne, to your point, the quality of the people you surround yourself with, the wise counsel that you build to become better at life or spiritually better or professionally more effective carries a different meaning, right? You've got to be willing to, I think, ask bigger questions, talk about deeper topics, actively take a role in how you positively interpret their responses and criticisms. And so we're playing Roblox last night, my son and I, and Somebody puts a message on the screen, not to him directly, just broadcast out to all the players in the game that was more vulgar and less appropriate for an eight-year-old audience than was even necessary to play the game, right? Which happens in real world too, but to combat that, I think it still falls on us as parents or as instructors or mentors or guides to teach kids how to deal with those things. It may not be cyberbullying or some more extreme case. But maybe it's just what they see online or what they watch on YouTube or a random commentator that they hear commenting on reviews and other videos online, that it's still how you interpret the inputs that are around you. That hasn't changed. Case in point, let's say approximately 2,000 years ago when the Bible was written, in Proverbs it actually says, seek wise counsel. And now here we are roughly 2,020 years later, you're saying the exact same thing, and yet it still holds weight, relevance, and merit. Alrighty, folks, sit tight, and we'll be right back on Transacting Value. Thomas Jefferson wrote in a letter to George Washington in 1787 that agriculture is our wisest pursuit because it will, in the end, contribute most to wealth, good morals, and happiness. Did you know that even at a nearly $1 billion valuation, farmers markets nationwide still authentically serve their local markets as direct-to-consumer, farm-fresh models of freedom, self-reliance, and teamwork? At the Keystone Farmers Market in Odessa, Florida, those same ideals also cultivate an agritourism experience, preserving the old ways of wholesome, family-oriented, sustainable growth of produce and people. For premium quality produce at affordable prices, opportunities for the kiddos to feed the baby cows, or to simply wander the garden and watch your future meals grow, visit Keystone Farmers Market on Facebook, or come by in person to 12615 Tarbon Springs Road. Keystone Farmers Market. The place with the boiled peanuts. 
let's say approximately 2000 years ago when the Bible was written in Proverbs, it actually says seek wise counsel. And now here we are roughly 2020 years later, you're saying the exact same thing and yet it still holds weight, relevance and merit. So there's gotta be some truth to that as well. I appreciate you bringing up that point and taking an active role each day to increase that quality, I think also pays it forward from your present self to your future self. And then in the future, you can cash in on the equity you've built and be happier, be more content. I think that was a powerful statement. So I just wanted to interject real quick, but I have one more question for you before we close this out, Master Wynn. Sure. So what are some current challenges that you're facing as you continue to improve your alignment between your values, your perspective, your outlook on life, and then your actual lifestyle? What challenges do you face? I would say other, just sidestepping getting older. Getting older has its own set of challenges that I don't think really apply here. I'll take it in a different direction. I'll just say it like this. This will make sense to everybody. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, that you live to be 80 years old. Okay? Mm -hmm. So if you live to be 80 years old, a lot of people that you love are going to die. Parents, your grandparents, maybe some of your kids, your brothers and sisters, deep friends, they may die naturally. They may die in accidents. They may get murdered. But you're going to see a lot of people die. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen. You're going to see a lot of other bad things. You're going to see wars, maybe world wars, more than a couple of wars. You're going to see global warming. You're going to see friends of yours go bankrupt. You're going to lose all your money, you're going to go bankrupt. You'll get in a car accident. You'll be paralyzed from the waist down. I mean, it's a never-ending list of very bad things that you're going to have to deal with with relation to you. Imagine if somebody's 100 years old. Imagine what they've seen. If you were 100 years old now, imagine what you've seen in your 100 years. World War One, or longer than 100, I guess. World War One into Korean War, Vietnam War. You get where I'm going. Sure. So how do you deal with that? You know, the Bible calls it beauty from ashes. And I call it collateral beauty because mm. the darkest night of all time did not turn out all the stars. You have to learn to accept the fact that these things are going to happen and that if you look hard enough, you'll find something beautiful and spectacular that came about as a result, a direct result of the bad calamity or the bad thing that happened to you or somebody else. And I'll give you an example of that. Mm -hmm. This is an example of my life. When my dad, my dad was 18 years old and he was drafted in World War II and he was on a destroyer in the Philippines fighting the Japanese. He was an anti-aircraft gunner. He used to shoot a Japanese zero. He was 18 years old. And he's on the battleship with a friend. And, of course, you know, they had pen pals. All these guys, you know, they had their girlfriends that wrote them from home. And when the mail came in, that was a really big deal because they got communication from home. But he didn't have a girlfriend. So he asked his friend on this battleship, this random guy, if his girlfriend had a friend that he could write. <laughs> and he did. So he gave him this girl's name and address, and my dad started to write her, and she wrote him back. And then when he got back, when he was, well, the war was over, he was only in there for about a year and a half, maybe two, and then the war was over. When he came home, he met her in person, and that's my mother. Whoa. So if Hitler had not invaded Poland and the Japanese hadn't have bombed Pearl Harbor, I wouldn't have been born. Man. Now, you may think that's a stretch, but I don't think that's a stretch. I think that's a perfect example of when calamity hits, when the freight train comes and hits you, and it always does, what do you do with it? What do you do with it? You know, mm. bad things happen to good people. And that's where I think, that's where I think a spiritual life comes in. And I'm not talking about religious concepts. I'm not talking about that. Religious concepts are completely different than spirituality, at least by my definition. Mm -hmm. My definition is spiritual development is connected to my higher power. My higher power, mine, and how I relate to the universe and what that means to me. So 
if I accept the fact that that's going to happen and then these things happen, I turn to my spiritual development to help me find where the collateral beauty is. And it's always there. And it's not obvious, or usually it's not. And usually it might take a long time to find it. But if you can do that, if that's a skill you have through prayer, through meditation, through counsel with other people, in other words, asking for help when you need it, and a camaraderie of spirit with a really good family and a really good community, that creates in itself a wonderful bond of love and nurturing that everybody needs because you're going to need it a lot in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. That is, I think, the number one skill set that I'm working on now, me personally, is because in my lifetime, there's a lot of things I've had to deal with. And the more I focus on my spiritual development, the more in tune with that I become and the easier it is for me to accept it, look for the collateral beauty, and move on. Alrighty, folks, sit tight, and we'll be right back on Transacting Value. Alrighty, folks, here at Transacting Value, we write and produce all the material for our podcast in-house, gain perspective alongside you, our listeners, and exchange vulnerability and dialogue with our contributors every Monday morning. But for distribution, Buzzsprout's a platform to use. You want to know how popular you are in Europe or how Apple is a preferred platform to stream your interviews? Buzzsprout can do that. You want to stream on multiple players through an RSS or custom feed or even have references and resources to take your podcast professionalism, authenticity, and presence to a wider audience? Buzzsprout can do that too. Here's how. Start with some gear that you already have in a quiet space. If you want to upgrade, Buzzsprout has tons of guides to help you find the right equipment at the right price. Buzzsprout gets your show listed in every major podcast platform. You'll get a great looking podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and more. Podcasting isn't hard when you have the right partners. The team at Buzzsprout is passionate about helping you succeed. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. Plus, following the link in the show notes lets Buzzsprout know we sent you gets you a $20 credit if you sign up for a paid plan and helps support our show. You want more value for your values? Buzzsprout can do that too. The more I focus on my spiritual development, the more in tune with that I become and the easier it is for me to accept it, look for the collateral beauty and move on. Because some people get stuck and never get out. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get stuck and never get out. So that's, in my opinion only, you have a choice to make, and you're the only one that can make it, because you only get one shot, that's it, one shot, and from the very moment you're conceived, there's a date, a day and a time out in the future you're going to die, from the moment you're conceived, and what you do between that moment and the other moment is up to you, and if you wait to be happy, you're going to run out of time, that's what I'm working on. Well, that's sort of the... The perfect weapon, you know, I think, especially because for anybody listening, I'm currently active duty in the Marine Corps. And I think when we talk about weapons, they carry negative connotations more often than not, because, well, the end state is obviously to either encourage or defend against or interdict some sort of violent clash of wills and influence that one direction or another when we talk about weapons. But the other aspect to a weapon is protection and its resilience and it's your ability to understand how and when to use that and then to what effect that ultimately either increases the lethality of a fighting force. I think that was maybe Dave Grossman from On Killing. I can't remember. But anyway, to increase the lethality of a fighting force or to make its bearers more spiritually resilient. And we've got ethical training. We've got laws of war, essentially, to conduct ourselves by, as active duty especially, but to understand when the use of deadly force can be authorized. It's not all chaos, despite a natural tendency to seem that way. It's ordered and structured in every country, no matter the war, no matter the location, encourages that. But the people representing those intentions 
I mean, that, that's part of an instant willing obedience to orders and discipline, right? That's also why a lot of people don't stay in the military for 20 years. That's why that is a sacrifice. Because sometimes you have to subjugate not your values, not your perspective, but your personal intentions to those of a, some sort of strategic end state. And I think the challenges that you're describing, Master Wayne, are your interpretation may be specific to you and your perspective. But the implication of what you're saying, it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter your orientation, your setting, your background, whatever region of the world, there's all sorts of ways we can interpret what happens to us or what happens because of us. And I think developing a spiritual resilience to that is huge. I mean, that's, that's ultimately what's going to guide how you interpret what's happening and then make decisions based on it. So Master Wayne, for the sake of time, though, I really appreciate you coming onto the podcast and your willingness just to be vulnerable and, and share some of your perspective with everybody listening. And so if people want to get in touch with you, find out more about the Family Martial Arts Center or just your background, what are some ways that people can reach out? If you need more information, you can go to Mount Dora Karate, that's spelled M-T, it's abbreviated, M-T Dora, D-O-R-A Karate, K-A-R-A-T-E dot com. My website will pop up. If you want information, you can just put your name and number in there, hit a button, it comes to me, and uh, I would be glad to communicate with you, no problem. Perfect. And for everybody who's more familiar with our podcast, if I say the internet, we'll put a link to that website in the show notes for this conversation as well. So when you look at the description, click show more or see more depending on your streaming platform, and you'll be able to click right on that link as well. Master Wayne, I, again, I really do appreciate your time and uh, thank you for coming on. Sure, Josh. It's my pleasure. Akuna Matata. Akuna <laughs> Matata. To everybody else listening, thank you for tuning in and joining us as we talk about our core values for January of determination, self-respect, and accountability. And to everybody that Master Wayne has impacted and that has influenced him and all of the students at the Family Martial Arts Center and all of these references that you brought up, I just want to sort of indirectly say thank you to those because without that inspiration, there's no way this conversation would have been as impactful as it was. So to everybody that played a role there. Now to our show partners, Keystone Farmers Market, Hoof and Clucker Farms, and obviously Buzzsprout for your distribution. Thank you as well. Folks, if you're interested in joining our conversation or you want to discover our other interviews, you can check out transactingvaluepodcast.com. And follow along on social media where we continue to stream new interviews every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on all your favorite podcasting platforms. So until next time, that was Transacting Value.